All right, I think it's uh, it's getting going here. All right, there we are. Welcome, everyone. I'm Chris Smith. I'm here with my host, co-host Chrissy Dunnady, and this week we have Sean Bagshaw and David Cobb. Welcome, everyone. Hello. Woo! We are going to be talking about photographing Oregon. We're going to be talking also about, uh, Sean's going to do a demo later on smart objects and, uh, it's going to be totally awesome. So before we do that, uh, we're going to uh, welcome you guys. Uh, if you want to let us know where you're coming from in the comments, go ahead and put that. Uh, let us know what's going on there. Seems like the big thing right now is COVID's kind of blowing up. That's what I'm dealing with, dealing with uh, out of Death Valley. Uh, we're going to be headed there in just a couple of weeks. It's still on. We're really, really excited for it uh, and to see you guys, uh, those of you that will be there in Death Valley. Uh, but we also just announced Oregon just a few weeks ago and it sold out right away. And uh, that was actually one of our things, right, Chrissy, was to have Sean and David on and talk all about Oregon. And we're still going to do that, and we're really excited for it. But uh, but the conference itself is uh, is onto a wait list for people uh, to join it. So, um, so Chrissy, ask some things. Oh, <laughs> go ahead. <laughs> well, I was just going to say, you could still sign up for the wait list if you want Oregon. But we also have Out of the Great Smoky Mountains, which is going to be great. That's so. right. We have a couple spots left for out of the Great Smoky Mountains. And then the one that I was kind of like, I don't know if how this is going to go is uh, out of Chicago Live. We did it the very first year uh, when COVID first hit and it was hugely popular. We did it again last year and people are like, we're still glad you totally did it. And it was awesome. And this year I'm like, you know, everyone's kind of getting back to shooting. And now people are starting to lock back down again. And it's like, all right, maybe it's a really good thing we're still doing out of Chicago Live. And that's going to be March 11th through the 13th. And both Sean and David are going to be teaching there. We're really excited for that. So, um, you know what, let's do um, a little bit of introductions for those of you that don't know Sean and David. And actually, Chrissy, I'm going to make you do this. Go ahead. <laughs> You're going to make me do this? Why don't we let Sean and David do this? Uh, well, okay, then fine. So Sean Bagshaw, uh, <laughs> First off, Sean uh, and David are both part of a group called Photo Cascadia. Uh, they've both taught with us before. Sean has taught with us in Oregon and was just with us in Acadia as well. Uh, David taught with us actually surprisingly, but it was awesome, at the Out of Chicago Botanic Garden Conference the very first year. The first time I met David, or the first time I got to know David at all was when we were at the uh, Rockford Japanese Gardens, and I see this beautiful book there uh, of all Japanese gardens. I'm like, who's this David Cobb guy? We got to find him. And it turns out, you know, he's with Sean and doing all these other things. And we had him at the garden conference. It was awesome. Sean Bagshaw, on the other hand, you know, he's kind of uh, a legend in his own right. And we and I hear all these things about him. And uh, and the first time I meet him is up on this mountain up in Iceland. And he's like, oh, are you Chris Smith? I'm like, are you Sean Bagshaw? And that's the story. So, uh, <laughs> so Sean, uh, tell us a little bit uh just about Photo Cascadia and your background with that and, and your photography, just a little bit. Sure. Yeah, I'm Sean Bagshaw. I'm um, based in Ashland, Oregon. Ashland's kind of the, the last town uh, before you hit California. So if you're on the interstate headed through Oregon towards Mount Shasta in Northern California, you'd go through my town. That'd be the last town in Oregon you'd, you'd go through. Uh, I'm been doing landscape and nature and travel photography for getting close to 20 years now and a lot of photo education. And uh, through that journey in photography and the photography work and education I do, I uh, met the other members of Photo Cascadia and we formed it as a group uh, almost 12 years ago. Is that right, David? 2009? Is 2009, yeah. So uh, yeah, almost 13 years ago, actually. Yeah, so Photo Cascadia is seven Northwest based landscape photographers. Uh, it's uh, David and myself, uh, Aaron Bobnick, Adrian Klein, Zach Schnepp, Chip Phillips, and Kevin McNeil make up the team. And um, yeah, we are just mostly friends, but also colleagues, and we do some projects together, but we mostly just give each other a hard time and uh, try to hang out every once in a while. And we're trying to see each other as a group for the first time. Uh, this coming up weekend in two years uh, for obvious reasons. And uh, we're still waiting to see between weather and surging tsunamis of pandemic. We're going to see how that works out. 
<laughs> awesome. And, and the other way that uh, a lot of people know you is through the work that you do with uh, Tony Kuiper. Is that right? You want to talk about that real quick, too? Sure. Yeah, I've been, uh, you know, doing photography and Photoshop image developing education for a long time now. And through that process, uh, I kind of got connected with Tony Kuiper, who um, who produces the TK panels for Photoshop for making luminosity masks and doing a ton of other things, basically making Photoshop even better. And at some point, Tony and I talked about and he asked me if I would do the training materials to teach people how to use his tools. And so I've been doing that now for about 10 years as well. Awesome. And David, give us a little of your background uh, before coming to Photo Cascadia and that whole thing and everything else you got going on. Well, I've been photographing all, pretty much all my life and uh, really got more involved in the early 2000s. I think Sean and I started about the same year as professionals, um, 2004. So uh, I've been doing workshops since then and uh, making my way through photography. And as Sean mentioned, that uh, Photo Cascadia group got together in 2009. So it's been great being a part of that. And uh, a big part of my photography has also been Japanese gardens, which you mentioned earlier, Chris. And with those Japanese gardens, I have two books out, Quiet Beauty, Japanese Gardens in North America which features the top Japanese gardens in North America, and then Visionary Landscapes, which features the top Japanese garden designers in the United States. And so those are two projects I did on my own, and that was a lot of fun. Uh, I've been doing a lot of garden photography, but I also do a lot of landscape photography, especially with Photo Cascadia. And I live on the opposite end of the state of Oregon as Sean does. He lives by the California border. I live by the Washington border, um, east of the Cascade Range, and so I live in Mosier, Oregon, which is on the Columbia River, and we got two feet of snow last night, so I've been digging out of that all day long. <laughs> that's so right. That, that's my life right now, but looking forward to the Photo Cascadia meetups. I haven't seen these folks, and some of them in almost two years, so looking forward to that, too. So let's show some uh, some of your guys' Oregon photos, uh, and... Uh, Let's see let's here. Learn a little bit about them. Yeah, yeah, and let's talk a little bit about Oregon here. So you guys want to jump in and comment on on uh, any of these photos here, and we'll kind of scroll through as well. And so, kind of, what are your favorite things to photograph in in Oregon? I think um, one of the things to just kind of set the stage for photographing in Oregon is that uh, you know Oregon is. I think one of the most beautiful states, and I think a lot of people agree with me. Um, and historically, I, it gets a little less visited than our other neighbors here on the West Coast. Uh, you know, Washington has big sites like Mount Rainier, and um, you know, obviously California's got Yosemite and Death Valley and things like that. Uh, Oregon's got Crater Lake, but in terms of kind of big, well-known landscapes. Um, it's, it's a little off the radar, which means that as you explore around the beauty of Oregon, you see very few other people in, unless you go to certain key spots. But for most of the point part, you can have the landscape in, in Oregon to yourself. And the other thing that's great about Oregon is it's so varied. You have, you know, obviously the Pacific Ocean, you've got the coast range of mountains, you've got the, the Western valleys, they've got the Cascade Range, and then you've got the Eastern Oregon high desert. So we really have just about every environment and ecosystem here. Um, so yes, we've just got a, kind of a selection of photos from different areas. And this is a photo I took up uh, at one of the mountain lakes in Southern Oregon, not too far from my house, just about 45 minutes from my house, right at the end of our snowstorm that we had last week. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, but just to show the diversity, some of these things so different. Is and this, uh, areas that I really like, this is in Eastern Oregon. This is uh, the John Day Fossil Beds National Monument. So this, this area is called the Painted Hills. And, you know, heading east, there are a lot fewer photographers. And people think of Oregon with these big, tall forests and, the, of course, the beaches and waterfalls. But, you know, two-thirds of the state is high desert and Great Basin Desert. So it's a lot of grass and sagebrush and not a lot of people out that way. So I like going there a lot more too. Um, again, part of that diversity that Oregon offers. The Cascade Mountains obviously are a big feature in Oregon. Um, kind of part of the name of our group, Photo Cascadia, 
originates from the Cascade Range or the Cascadia region. And uh, it's, a, it's a mountain chain of, of, of volcanoes. It runs from uh, up in BC, Canada, all the way down to Northern California, kind of ending down at Mount Lassen, south of Mount Shasta. This image is uh, Mount Jefferson, which is one of my favorite of the, uh, the Oregon Cascades. And this area, Jefferson Park, it's, it's a wilderness area. You can only backpack into it. And it's just stunning. Uh, unfortunately, this area burned in one of the big forest fires that we had uh, uh, over, over a year ago. And I haven't heard or been back into this area to see how well it survived or if it survived. But uh, anyway, it was beautiful, yeah. at least. That's one of my favorite photos again. of Sean, by the way, because when I walked the Pacific Crest Trail from Mexico to Canada, I got up to that point and I looked back and I said, my little point and shoot is never going to be able to capture that image. And Sean captured the way I was feeling from that that place perfectly. So I, I really like this shot. That's awesome. Yeah, Aww. I love that one. Yeah. Uh, what is this? We put this in here, so but I don't is, even know what this is. This is Fort Rock, which is a, another kind of volcanic historical, you know, it's a, a volcanic remnant out in the central Oregon high desert. It's southeast of Bend, Oregon by, I don't know, maybe about 30, 40 miles, something like that. And sagebrush, rabbit brush and volcanic rocks and very, like I said, high deserty. And it's, as David was saying earlier, some of the kinds of landscapes that a lot of people who haven't been to Oregon don't even associate with Oregon. And, and that place you, has a lot of antiquities too. And this is down in the Boardman State Park. Uh, Sean's next oh, shot is down sorry. in the Boardman Bay, Bay Park. Um, and we, we just love going down there too. It's just part of what the coast offers. The coast is so varied. You get these cliffs way down in the south and in, in the central area, you got some really nice lighthouses and beaches and the northern area you have more of the sea stacks. So it's just, uh, a wonderful diversity. You get tired of one place, you go to the next and it just, it, it'll keep you going. More Oregon coast scenery, lots of sea stacks, wonderful tide pools and beaches at low tides. Obviously on the West Coast sunsets are a, a feature. Um, this is Battle Rock Beach, which is near Port Orford, Oregon. So this isn't close to um, where out of Oregon is going to be on the Oregon coast. But these kinds of uh, coast, this kind of coast scenery is all up and down the Oregon coast. So a lot of similarities with the area around Newport, Oregon. Right. Yeah. So we'll be based out of Newport. Uh, but yeah, lots of scenes like this that we'll be looking at. Uh, but this one for sure, right? This is right there, isn't it, Sean? That is Newport. Yep. That's the yeah. Quinnahead Lighthouse and... Uh, uh, was it Cobble Beach, I think, is the name of that particular beach. That sounds right. Uh, yeah, yep. so that's, so. that's one of the locations for the, for the Out of Oregon Conference, and so is this, maybe. Conditions <laughs> going. <laughs> so, Conditions so this is really the, dictate. This is the famous, infamous uh, Thor's Well, is that right, Sean? It is. Yeah, yeah. So sometimes you see the shot from a lot closer up and it can be uh, extremely dangerous. So it is it is close to where we'll be. And so we'll just, uh, we'll, you know, we've got the instructors that uh, know this better than anyone and they'll be able to help you to get the best possible shot that we can get in the safest way possible. So yeah, we'll be helping people to get that as well. So awesome. Uh, Chrissy, you want to lead us into our next part then? So yeah, let's actually talk about, you mentioned when you're photographing, a lot of times you guys go backpacking. How do you guys decide with so much varied? Do you, you know, spend a lot of time in one area? Do you pick a couple places throughout the year and try and hit them up? How do you guys choose? Uh, last year was an easy choice because Sean and I are working on, with Photo Cascadia, uh, we're working on a Washington book now. And Sean and I decided to hit, was it six places in six days, Sean? It was, yeah. Yeah, so every day we'd go to a new location and we'd backpack up and camp there overnight and photograph and photograph in the morning, hike out, go to the next place, backpack up, camp. So it was a lot of fun. And we've been doing trips together since 
I think 2000, not, 2008, actually, was our first trip together. Correct. And, and I'll just how... say, as far as the backpacking goes, uh, David is probably one of the most uh, experienced uh, backpackers with the most mileage. He's hiked the Pacific Crest Trail, uh, the, the Continental Divide Trail. You'll have to, you know, across Iceland. He's hiked across parts of Canada. He's hiked the entire Oregon coastline. Uh, you name it, David has hiked it and backpacked it. So he's a great person to go backpacking with. And um, yeah, backpacking and photography is, is wonderful because it enables you to see places that you wouldn't see otherwise. You can't drive to them. Uh, you have to get there under your own power and you kind of have to live in that environment for a while. So you really get to know the landscape and you get to see it in all different weather conditions and lighting conditions and, uh, and it's adventurous and it's fun. And the more that you're out there, the more that you know what's coming, uh, what kind of weather you're going to get, uh, what kind of challenges you're going to get the best place maybe to make your camp so you can get a good picture in the morning or that evening. So I, I think the backpacking has really helped my photography a lot just by getting a feel for what's going on in nature and being prepared for the, the photograph photography I want to take, want to do. Is there somewhere you'd recommend for someone say like me, like <laughs> I've been camping before, but I've never done like backwoods hiking. Is there a place you would recommend or what's the best way to get into something like that? Or is it to find maybe another photographer that does that and say, Hey, can I join you for a trip? Uh, any suggestions on that guys? I think the, the second thing you said makes sense. Yeah. If you can find a, a partner or a, a sensei who kind of knows the ropes already, uh, that's that's great if you can find that person. Uh, but I would say, you know, just, you know, start easy. There are plenty of places that you can backpack into that maybe are only a mile or two in, maybe aren't particularly uh, difficult hiking uh, that have, you know, you go at a time of year where you're pretty assured of good weather and uh, just use that to kind of ease into it, test out your systems, test out your equipment and slowly work your way up to longer hikes, more, um, you know, more challenging terrain and, and maybe more challenging weather situations. I would agree with Sean, totally. And uh, Sean's a good person to go backpacking with too because he started his photography mountain climbing. So he's climbed a ton of mountains uh, in the Sierra Nevadas and the Cascades, and he's climbed Denali twice. So. When we go uphill, Sean kicks my butt every single time. <laughs> All right, good. Uh, and as we're going here, if you guys have questions, feel free to put them in the comments. We'll throw some questions up for Sean and David, and uh, we'll get those answered. Um, uh, as a matter of fact, we just had one, right? Um, and it was the it's the one of the perfect questions in terms of gear. So how heavy are your packs but also when you're packing further out how do you minimize and strip down kind of your gear or your lenses to determine what you're going to take with you that that's a good question and i actually wrote a blog on this particular subject on photocascadia.com if you go to the blog you can do a search for backpacking with camera equipment and it will be listed there so that's the quick answer but uh I try to pare down as much as possible. I don't want to carry too much. I get as the lightweight gear. Um, I have a lightweight pack. The best thing you can do right off the bat is not have a super heavy pack with lots of metal in it. If you have a lighter pack, that cuts seven pounds off your pack right there. So um, I have a smaller sleeping bag, smaller rest uh, pad, and uh, you know, I, I try to keep it small. And now I have the new Canon R camera, uh, the mirrorless, so the smaller camera too. So that's going to be a little bit lighter. Sean, anything to add there? Yeah, I think uh, if you can afford lightweight gear, that's a good way to go. Mm. Uh, and David and I are not getting younger right now, obviously. <laughs> so I used to stomp around with a giant 80 pound pack because I thought that was cool. And that was kind of a badge of honor. Mm. These days, if I can get my pack down to between 30 to 40 pounds in that range, closer to 30 if I can, that's what I'm going for. 
Um, and when it comes to camera gear, I really just try to take the bare minimum. That usually means a camera body and one lens for sure. And I try to take the lens that I think is going to most suit the, the terrain and the landscape that I'm going to be photographing. Or if I just can't get it down to one lens, I'll bring two lenses. Usually my lenses that I'll take backpacking are a, a wide angle zoom and then a, and then a lightweight telephoto. Also for backpacking, um, instead of always going with um, F 2.8 lenses, those tend to be the biggest, heaviest lenses. And it's nice to have F 2.8 for, you know, portraits and things like that. But if you can go with an F 4 or an F 5.6 lens, that's still good quality. The same focal length lens with uh, the, without the wide aperture is going to be smaller and lighter. So, um, and if you're shooting landscapes on, uh, on a tripod, F 2.8 is probably not something you need anyway. Yeah, that was my next question is what about a tripod? Do you bring a, a, a backpacking travel tripod or do you bring the, the big tripod? I, I bring I a backpacking travel tripod. All right. I think oh, okay. <laughs> Sean, Sean, go first. Sorry. Sorry. My bad. <laughs> I have a, I have a backpacking tripod. Okay. How I have about a you, backpacking David? What do you tripod too. I, yeah. I have a, I have a, um, backpacking tripod. So lightweight, not the thing I would use in the city or on the Oregon coast or when I'm in my car, something that I'm hack, um, hiking with. And I, I keep that light. And can I say that last part again? And the light ball head oh, too. Right, ball right, head right, right. A lot, so, yeah. yeah. Uh, Ken's asking about like as far as like solar charging or anything like that. Are there things out there that uh, you know special things that you know without it you wouldn't be able to do what you're doing? There are small portable solar chargers that you can clip to the outside of your backpack, so it's actually charging as you're hiking. Um, you can charge small things with those they don't pull in a ton of uh of electricity but you can charge like a cell phone you might get a little charge on a camera battery or something like that what i tend to do instead of trying to bring a charger is i bring four or five camera batteries and that's all i have i'm not bringing like a laptop and that kind of stuff into the wilderness so with three or four or five camera batteries i can usually last you know days and i don't need to yes. charge that's exactly what I do too. All right, Chrissy, you want to go on to our next segment? Yeah. I mean, we've talked so much about the grand landscape and, you know, these wide angle scenes, but I think also with Oregon, there's so much to see in the smaller scenes. And David, I think you've prepared a little bit of, for us to learn about photographing small scenes or about Oregon. So why don't you introduce us a little bit more and let's see a little bit of the smaller stuff. Okay. Awesome. All yeah, right. I, I, Go ahead. You know, I, I, I photograph a lot on the Oregon coast and for me on those cloudy days, I love to go for the smaller scenes. Um, I, I love the grand landscape on the Oregon coast too, but those smaller scenes to me also tell part of the story and they're a part of uh, what you want to bring back with you to tell some of that story of where you've been. And the tide pools are a good place to start. Polarizers help a little, but not that much. So when I photograph tide pools, I'm usually carrying an umbrella or I've got my jacket splayed out where I can get some shadow in there. And the sea anemones here, I don't look for those big sea anemones that you see everywhere. There's some really showy sea anemones all along the Oregon coast, and they're about as big as your fist. But I don't photograph those because their tentacles are moving all the time. I even charge up my ISO a lot more. And the, the larger the sea anemone, the more they move. So I look for the small ones in the cracks and crevices underwater that are about nickel to quarter size. Um, and I put up my umbrella or my coat and photograph those. And I'm really paying attention to my focal plane. So when you're doing all of that, uh, some of these shots can take 20 or 30 seconds. So the fact that that shot is so sharp and it was a 30 second shot, shot um, shows you how little those sea anemones move when they're about a nickel or quarter size. Other things I look for in tide pools are starfish. 
Um, and with starfish, they are moving. These sea stars move. There's a lot of variety of sea stars in the Oregon coast. There's leather stars, brittle stars. This is a blood star. There are also um, sun stars and okra sea stars. And for me, the I turn up my ISO because even those starfish look like they're stationary, they're not. So with this particular image, I probably had my ISO up to about 400 because starfish move their arms, they're moving around. So I wanna get a quicker shot. And sometimes I'll put it on extension tube for the smaller starfish like this. And I'm using a polarizer on this one because the sea stars give off glare and that eelgrass that's there too also gives off glare. So the polarizer is gonna help a lot. It's gonna saturate the, the seagrass to make it more green and it's gonna saturate the starfish to let that red come out a little bit more. Other scenes I look for um, along the Oregon coast might be just beach patterns and maybe at sunset I'll do some of this or, or sunrise. And again, your focal plane will help a lot being even with your subject matter. Uh, otherwise, one part's going to be in focus, one part's going to be out of focus. So try to parallel uh, with your subject matter. I try to look for patterns that look maybe like forests or trees. And with this, I am using my polarizer because the polarizer will help tamp down a lot of the shimmers that's coming off the rest of the sand, sand and make it uh, more tree-like. And I love these kind of veins that uh, the runoff from the sea spray and the, and, and the water receding and the tide receding uh, makes these wonderful patterns and lines. So other things I look for on the Oregon coast for smaller sceneries, there's a lot of sand dollars up and down the coast and you get your macro lens on and take a shot here of uh, a sand dollar and get some patterns if you want, but I like to have it when the surf is going by. Maybe some foam lapping by there for this particular image. I like the repeating patterns and I turn up my ISO with this. With this one, I wanted the surf to be more stationary, so I turned, turned up my ISO. Again, with a lot of those smaller scenes, I'm really concentrating on my focal plane and trying to get parallel to my subject. My lens is parallel to the subject. And uh, on this one too, I'm using my polarizer again because a lot of the shimmer in that foam will give off a ton of reflection. And I want the beach to be a little bit more saturated, a little bit dark and, and not as shimmery with this particular shot. I love the harbors of along the Oregon coast too. And there's a lot of small scenes to be had in the harbors. I like abstracts. I like to look for a Jackson Pollock kind of abstracts. Um, and when I'm in the harbors, I'm usually going to the boat that is kind of like a sea scowl, the rustiest boat I can find, and I'll be there. I love those because the rust and the layers of paint uh, and the scrapings you see on there, it's just the rope, the, the boat rubbing against the pier and giving all sorts of scrapings. And I, I just like to look for abstracts there. Now I'm photographing these usually with a telephoto. I have a 70 to 200 Canon 2.8 lens, but I also have a 100 to 500 uh, Canon lens too. And so I'm getting on my telephoto there and I'm turning up my ISO somewhere between 400 and 800 because uh, I need speed and with that speed because the boats are moving and the docks are moving. So those two things moving around, I wanna make sure I'm getting a sharp shot. I might put on my autofocus on my camera too. So it's tracking that boat and keeping it sharp. And then I just look for some areas that I think are interesting. I do polarize these two because it helps with saturations here with the greens and the oranges. It helps that saturation more. Other things I like to do on docks is just look for smaller scenes. Uh, it might be ropes, it might be just little things that are hanging off of ships or buoys, but this was a wheelbarrow that had fallen in the ocean and stayed there for many, many years. And then someone uh, just brought it up out of the sea and it had barnacles all over it. 
but with that oxidation, the rust, the old paint, and all those particles, to me, that made just a wonderful abstract and something that you're not going to find anywhere except probably at a harbor with a bunch of old boats around. So some of the things I love to look for on the Oregon coast, um, along with other scenes in the harbor, when the light picks up a little bit more, I photograph some of the abstract reflections from the boats. So that I'm probably shooting more towards F8 or F11, and I might have my autofocus on to begin with. This scene, you do not want to polarize because if you polarize, you're going to get rid of your reflection. So do not use your polarizer. It's probably best to take the polarizer off and uh, you'll take a number of shots and you'll just keep shooting and shooting and shooting. But some of those things will look really fun and really amazing. And it's a great way to explore, great way to have fun as the sun picks up a little bit and just look for those wonderful reflections. And the last shot that I've got here, I look for rock patterns along the Oregon coast. There's some wonderful cliffs. There's wonderful rocks all along the coast. And there's wonderful patterns that you can see. Uh, with this, I'm setting my ISO at about 100. And I'm probably shooting around F22 and photographing on the top parts of the rock and letting those crevices come into focus as they may. And I am using my polarizer. You might want to, you might say, why would I use a polarizer on just rocks? It really does help saturate the colors. So the polarizer is going to help a lot with this particular image. It brought out some of the blues and purples in that bottom right stone. And so I just search around, look for wonderful rock patterns along the Oregon coast. And those are some of the things that I enjoy doing when it's a cloudy day on the Oregon coast and I want to see some of the smaller scenes. Uh, those are awesome. Those are some great photos there. Uh, we do have Thank a couple you. of questions and if people want to uh, put them in, we'll, we'll ask, uh, you know, I think that, uh, maybe you answered the ones from Susan. Um, you said it's mostly a 70 to 200 or maybe a 100 to 500. And I think you mentioned also sometimes you'll use an extension tube. So you're not really using uh, macro lenses for most of these shots. Is that right? With the tide pool, I am using my macro lens. Mm, okay. And uh, what I'll do is take my polarizer from a different lens and maybe hold it over my macro lens. Um, but I, with the tide pools, I'm, I'm using my macro lens and often extension tubes. Uh, on the Oregon coast, there's also something called nudibranchs, which are opulescent creatures that live in the tide pools. They're about as the wide as the cuticle on your fingernail. But with extension tubes, you can get them pretty large, and those are fun to photograph, too, if you can see them. Uh, but with a shot like this, I used an extension tube, and I'm using my 100 millimeter macro. With some of the other shots, I am using my telephoto. In the harbor, I'm usually using my telephoto on some of those shots. Now, with uh, your mindset, is this something that you go out just thinking I'm going to look for small scenes or is it something that, you know, you're out and you're just seeing what calls to you? How do you kind of prepare? That's a good question. Is it like, well, there's something or is it like today is small scenes day? <laughs> Sometimes I'm in the mood for small scenes, but uh, that's usually in the spring when the wildflowers are out and I just go out and photograph wildflowers. But on the Oregon coast, I'm usually trying to photograph the grand scenes. And if I, if it's cloudy day, there's always something, my friend uh, Christian Heave, he says there's always something to shoot, and it's true. So if the grand landscape isn't there, I'm going to start looking for the small stuff because uh, I'm there, I can spend hours doing it, I enjoy doing it, so I'm going to start looking for the small stuff. Um, and that's just kind of the way I roll. That's Sean and I when we were backpacking last year. It was a foggy day, the mountains were fogged in, and I turned around, and all of a sudden there was this wonderful oval of ferns and so you know why not photograph what's been given to me so i just go with the flow all right here's a huge question especially for those people that are going to out of oregon with us from carl and that is how do we deal with uh you know the sea spray getting on our camera gear uh so this is for sean and david uh yeah i mean there's a lot we can say about this who wants to go first Sean, why don't you go ahead? Uh, yeah, I think, well, there's there's probably 
two different it's a it's it's mostly a mindset i think and that is uh if you don't want to get any sea spray on your camera gear at all stay far far away from the ocean and your gear will be safe and dry and you won't have to worry about it if you want to photograph the ocean you're going to have to take the risk of some sea spray uh, and then it's just about kind of mitigating the risks uh, you can get plastic or Gore-Tex covers for your cameras. Uh, like David said, he has an umbrella for shading tide pools, but I have know a lot of photographers that carry an umbrella on the coast, and when they see sea spray coming, they just hold up the umbrella out in front of their, their camera to kind of shield it from the spray. Always carry a, a cloth with you that you can wipe it down. Um, and then when you get back to the hotel room, give it a good wipe down. But just be aware that, you know, that salty water over time, you know, one trip to the coast, you're probably not going to damage a camera. But um, I know <laughs> Nick Page, who also is a, is going to be at Out of Oregon, mm -hmm. um, he photographs on the coast a ton. And he's meticulous about taking care of his gear. But he has at least a couple of videos on his YouTube channel where he shows the, the corrosion on his cameras. And I think one even sent back to Sony recently and they said there's nothing they could do for it. And that's even with all the cleaning he does. So that's just kind of, um, if you're gonna be a coastal photographer, that, that can happen. And with that cloth, I might add a little water to that too to get the salt off, especially with a tripod. Um, I, I might wet the cloth first and uh, keep it open and extended all night long, let it dry off. But when you get back, extend it, wipe it off with a wet cloth, and then just let it sit and dry overnight, and then you're ready to go in the morning. Can I just take my tripod in the shower with me? Is that okay? Sure. You can, thanks. I can, okay. Yeah. <laughs> Showering with our to. tripods. It's going to yeah. be our next segment. There we go. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, yeah, and then David saying, and you got to watch the waves in Oregon, right? Uh, it's <laughs> the rogue waves. It's the, right? Um, the waves, uh, the logs, e even, you know, if the, the water is a, a an inch or a tenth of an inch. There's these huge logs on the Oregon coast and they roll. So do not sit on those logs because even a little bit of water can make those roll. And we lose tourists every year because of that happens. So really pay attention to the waves because uh, they change. About every 100th wave is a really big one. So pay attention. And that, that question was from David Day, is that right? That was right. I saw you laughing about that, yeah? Uh, yeah. So, uh, so David, David Day, is speaking, speaking from experience, he was on a workshop with, uh, with David Cobb and I in, uh, out of Brookings in Southern Oregon, and we had huge surf, and he was outside the hotel up on the lawn photographing the waves, and a giant rogue wave came all the way up to the hotel and swept him in his gear into the ocean. He got out, his, his gear, uh, didn't quite make it so well. Wow. Yeah. That's crazy. Yeah. Ooh. But you weren't kidding when you say like, stay far away. <laughs> that's, that was a rare wave event. Uh, and yeah, that's, that was, yeah. Yeah. Very, for very sure. rare. So it's mostly much safer than that. <laughs> Whew. So yeah, those were some awesome images, great ideas on the small scenes. I love it. If you want to see more from David Cobb, uh, you can go to his website here, uh, dmcobbphoto.com, and you can learn about some of those books. I think it was this book here, The Quiet Beauty, uh, The Japanese Gardens in North America, that was that first place where I'm like, who is this David Cobb guy? This guy is awesome. He's got some amazing photos in there, and uh, we're just really lucky to have him uh, as one of our instructors. Uh, anything you want to add? Add to that, David, as far as things they could look for at your site there? Uh, well, with this particular one, and I also have an ebook on garden photos, uh, 100 Tips for Garden Photography. So if you're more into ebooks as opposed to solid books, that's uh, available on the website too. Yeah, and, and that was awesome having David at the Chicago Botanic Garden Conference the first time we did it because we had people that were there. They were just focused on uh, photographing flowers and getting those great shots like that. But David was taking people and photographing the Japanese garden and just doing the garden landscapes and just so many different things you can do in places like that. So uh, give it a lot of diversity. So that was, that was uh, something special when we were able to do that. Uh, all right. Oh, we're yep, going to talk about more. this too. Yeah, I forgot. 
So they also have two books available through Photo Cascadia. Um, Photo, Photographing Through the Seasons is an ebook, and then Oregon My Oregon as well. And um, for one lucky winner tonight, they're going to win an autographed copy of Oregon My Oregon. Um, so we have one question. I'll let everybody get ready because you just have the first person to get it right and type it in the comment. Oh, so this wins. is it right now. Like I wasn't really prepared for this. Like this is, we're oh, doing yeah. the giveaway right now. All right. We're doing the giveaway right now. Yeah. Okay. I mean, we talked all, right. all about Oregon. I want to feel inspired and somebody's going to get a whole beautiful book of Photo Cascadia's Oregon images. Awesome. So awesome. is everybody it. ready? Yeah. All right. Who is the most recent member to join Photo Cascadia? All I right, like and the first it, person to put the right answer into the comments is going to win. Is that right? That's right. All right, so they, they named all of them earlier, but they didn't say who the, the first one was. Oh. And Carl. Hi, Carl. You are the winner. <laughs> <laughs> Carl had good questions earlier, and I think he's first with the answer. Oh, we got a few right answers, but Carl was first, and it was Aaron Bobnick, right? Yes. Yeah, That's correct. absolutely. Yeah. So, oh. Carl, you can email me at chrissy at outofchicago.com. I know how I know Carl knows how to get in contact with me. Um, <laughs> so, and to claim your prize, congratulations. And anybody else who is interested, both of these are great resources as well as David's books. So check them out on David's website as well as on Photo Cascadia's. And that Oregon, my Oregon book is also the forewords written by two-time Hewlett's prize winner and former New York Times columnist, Nicholas Kristoff, who is currently running for governor of Oregon. So, Oh, wow. Huh. Yeah. Very cool. And this is kind of the same series then that your latest one will be as well, uh, about the state of Washington. Is that correct? That is correct. All yep. right. Awesome. How, how does that work when you do it from Photo Cascadia? Is this contributions from all the different members of your group, Sean? It is, yes. Um, the, the publisher is Timber Press Books. They're a, uh, a publishing company here in Oregon, out of Portland. And they actually contacted us. Had They had the idea about doing an Oregon book. And um, when they found Photo Cascadia, realized that with seven photographers, they could find all the photos for the entire book kind of in one place. And so they, they have been working with us. They worked with us on that project and, um, and Washington now as well. Uh, and and are, are you writing for it as well, or is it mostly just photos and captions, or what, what can we expect to see in there? Photos uh, and captions. We wrote some of it. Uh, some of the, the, they want us to describe each image, and also we wrote down the f-stop, uh, the ISO we were using, what camera we were using, and uh, other things about the shot in particular. Yeah, yeah. And it's great sometimes to go through those and say, man, I wonder, uh, you know, some of the settings that they used and to have that information there is, uh, you know, it can be a learning experience as well. So that's awesome. Yeah. All right. We going on to Sean, Chrissy, is that the plan? I, yeah, I think that is the plan. <laughs> okay. Let's see if we can make this work because Sean's going to be doing a demo for us here in uh, Photoshop, right? So, uh, Sean, we're going to let you take it away as far as, and actually Chrissy, Cr Cr Chrissy, you, you, you lead into this. And I thought what you said earlier was interesting. Go ahead. Well, one of, a lot of the things that we want to get out of this show for people and deliver to people is things that kind of change your photography. And one of the things that has really changed the trajectory of my photography was being introduced to smart objects. And the person who introduced me was none other than Sean Bagshaw. So I thought, what perfect person to come on and actually tell us some compelling reasons on why we should use them um, than himself. So Sean, do you want to start us I, off? And I'm going to interrupt too and just say, I don't know if the first time you saw it was when we were in Acadia for Out of Acadia, but the presentation that Sean was doing there really was kind of like an aha moment for me that I've kind of been a dumb object person for a really long time <laughs> and uh, just really excited to use smart objects more uh, after seeing him there. So yes, I apologize. Sean, go, go for it. You take over. It's all you now. Yeah. All right. Thanks. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. All right. And, uh, and we'll send it working, over to you here. Yeah. 
uh, when that comes up, we're, we're looking at Lightroom, actually. We're starting here in oh, Lightroom. Oh, my bad. But, um, if, if you exclusively use Lightroom for developing uh, RAW files, which I find is becoming more and more common these days, uh, Lightroom's really becoming kind of like the, the all-purpose image editing application, and a lot of people are using just Lightroom. Um, in Lightroom, you're always working on your RAW files with RAW level data, and it's always a non-destructive workflow. Uh, and that means that you can always undo things in Lightroom. Whatever you do, you can uh, modify them later. You can undo it entirely. You can reset things. Um, Photoshop has a little different way of working and it's not always non-destructive. You can do things in Photoshop that you can't later undo or reverse. Um, but Photoshop still provides greater control, uh, more and better tools, better mass and uh, better mass than Lightroom, even though Lightroom had a big update in the masking capabilities recently. Photoshop masks are still a kind of a next level. And uh, also in Photoshop, layers allow us to do things that just aren't even possible in Lightroom. So a lot of us are still finding that Photoshop is essential. Now this thing, smart objects. In 2005, smart objects were introduced in Photoshop, but a lot of people either don't know about them or only know a little bit about them. Um, and smart objects are a tool in Photoshop that can be used to combine the non-destructive nature of Lightroom with the power of Photoshop. And there's so many applications for smart objects. So to, tonight I'm just gonna kind of give you three and a quick demo of each to kind of get the idea of what smart objects can do. And uh, we'll see how we do with that. So here in Lightroom, um, I've got a raw file. This is a raw file from Colorado. And usually you would think, okay, with this raw file, I'm gonna make some uh, raw adjustments. So I might, with this image, think, well, I need to brighten it a little bit. Might wanna bring down my highlights, bring up my shadows quite a bit, maybe the blacks a little bit, work with contrast a little bit. And then maybe I think, oh, it needs some more saturation. So I'm gonna turn up the, uh, the vibrance here and really bring out that color. Awesome, okay, looks great. Now I'm gonna take it over to Photoshop and continue working on it in Photoshop. So to go from Lightroom to Photoshop, you come down to edit in and you say edit in Adobe Photoshop and that's going to take us over there. So I'm going to open this uh, image up one time in Photoshop as a non smart object and I'm going to go back to Lightroom and I'm going to open it again, but this time, so it's the same image, same adjustments, but in edit in, instead of just editing in Photoshop, I'm going to open it as a smart object in Photoshop. So here is the, uh, the smart object in Photoshop. And you can tell a smart object because it has this little smart object icon in the corner of the thumbnail right there. And so here's the smart object and here is the non-smart object. They look identical. But with the non-smart object, if I realize, oh, wow, I, uh, I, I really messed up that saturation back in Lightroom. I've got banding in the sky. The colors just look atrocious. What was I thinking? Uh, let me back that up. So uh, let's see, in Photoshop, that'd be the, a hue saturation adjustment. So I'm going to grab a hue saturation adjustment layer here. And whoa, that adjustment went way to the other screen. Here it is. And I'm going to try to back off the saturation. Boy, no matter how much I bring down the saturation, that banding is still there in the sky. I can't you know, by the time I get the trees not being oversaturated, now my mountain just looks kind of dull and my clouds look dull. I can't get it back. Huh, bummer. Now, here's the smart object that I opened. And this is what's called a raw smart object because I opened it from Lightroom from the raw data. Well, when you double click on a raw smart object, it opens you back up into camera raw, which is basically the Photoshop version of Lightroom. So here's Camera Raw, and if we notice, in Camera Raw, right up here, this says CR2. So this is telling me I am now back working with the raw data, the original raw data, which I didn't have in the non-raw uh, smart object. 
And here are all those adjustments I made back in Lightroom. There, they show up here. And there's that vibrance adjustment I made that totally killed the image. I can come in and back that off and find, you know, where's the right level of vibrance and then say, okay. And now that updates back here in Photoshop, the banding's gone, everything's back and it's raw level adjustments. Whereas when I brought that image over from Lightroom with those same adjustments, not as a smart object, I can't recover it. So that sort of raw level uh, access from inside of Photoshop is number one, benefit number one from, uh, from smart objects. Let me close these real quick and let's go to our next example here, back to Lightroom. Let me open up next this image. Uh, now I'm going to edit this not as a smart object. I'm just going to open it up as uh, just a regular pixel file here. And um, what we're going to see here is that let's say I want to use a filter. Photoshop, one of the things that Photoshop can do that Lightroom can't do is photo filters. Photoshop has a bunch of filters. Um, and for this image, I'm thinking, hmm, I think a blur, a slight blur on this image, blur filter would look good. So I go to the filter menu, I come down to the blur gallery, and I'm gonna put a path blur on here. And that allows me to stretch out this arrow and then also control how much blur. So I'm gonna add some nice blur to that. And then I'm gonna say, okay. So here's this awesome Photoshop blur that I use to blur out that image. And I love the look, but now I realize after I did it, that's going straight to the pixels and I can't undo it out of these pixels down here now. And I realized, you know what? I'd really like the blur only in the top part of the image. And I also think I overdid the blur a little bit, but with not a smart without a smart object, I can't, I'm stuck with this. This is what it is. So let me, let me back out of this here. Um, let me go back to before we did that. If instead of doing it to a regular pixel image, if I came here, this is just the layer panel menu and say, convert that to a smart object first. Now I've got that little smart object icon. Anything I do to this won't, it'll be a filter. Any filter I apply to this will be a filter, but it becomes a smart filter. So let me go back, same filter, blur gallery, path blur, same thing I did before. Uh, let's see here, where's my, there it is. Oop, I don't know why I just did that. I want, <laughs> escape that one, I want this one. So I'm gonna do that same blur, really blur it out, say okay. Let that update. Okay, now there it is, but it's a smart filter right here because I did the filter on a smart object, which means it comes with a filter mask, which means I can now mask the filter the filter out of parts of the image where I don't want it. So if I go onto that filter mask and now I've got the gradient tool, I can just draw a gradient on here and use that gradient to mask out the blur down here and leave it up here, something I couldn't do before. Also, because it's a smart filter, if I realize I over blurred it, I can double click on it here and that reopens the controls and I can turn down the blur and then update that. So, Using smart objects with filters turns them into smart filters. And this works not just with uh, Photoshop filters. It turns any filters, even from third party plugins into smart filters. So for example, if you use the NIC um, uh, software to make adjustments to images, smart objects turn your NIC filters into smart filters. And same with the Topaz stuff turns those into smart filters in Photoshop as well. So thing number two or reason number two is filters become smart filters with smart objects. Not gonna say that. Let me go back to Lightroom here and let's go to example or reason number three. We're gonna open this image up. Now this is a finished master TIFF file. This is not not a raw file. This is an image that I've already worked on in both in Lightroom and in Photoshop. But let me close the, the TK here so we can see all these layers. Here are all the layers uh, of my Photoshop adjustments. This is how it came out of Lightroom and then in making additional adjustments in Photoshop got me to this point. 
Uh, and a lot of times in Photoshop, this is one of those places where we can work ourselves into a, a destructive corner and destructive meaning something we can't get out of. At this point, I've added all these adjustments that have luminosity and color-based masks on them, which are very detailed masks that match the image pixel for pixel. That means I can't change any of the pixels down here in the background anymore, because if I move pixels or blur pixels or do anything like that, the pixels won't match the mass anymore. For example, if I decided I wanted to add that same blur filter to this image, I'm here on the background. If I come in here to filter, blur gallery, path blur, and add that blur, and really blur it out, and say OK, then what we see here is that once it finishes doing what it's going to do, waiting, waiting. <laughs> All right, here it is. So not only can I not control where the blur is, but you'll notice that because the blur doesn't match my masks, I can see ghosts of all the where the image detail used to be. So that's not going to work either. So let me jump out of there. So you might think, well, the, the solution for that is you just flatten all the layers or you merge all the layers to a new layer at the top. And now you could blur it and it would be fine. It won't interact with the mass or it won't, the mass won't affect it that way. But by if you do that, now you can't go back and readjust these later on if you find that you want to fine tune any of these previous adjustments. You basically are throwing all of those layers away and any control you had over them. So don't flatten. Instead, what you do is you select all the layers and you convert. So I'm just going to right click here when I have all those layers selected and say convert all the layers into a smart object. So instead of flattening to a single layer, I'm converting to a smart object that's a single layer. And there it is. So here's my smart object that's a single layer, kind of like I flattened it. And now when I go do that filter, same filter I've been doing here, blur it out, do this to it. Okay, there it is. Now that's a smart object that I'm doing it to. So and with all those layers, it's a lot of computer crunching time that it needs to do there. So here it is. So it's a smart filter again, which is awesome because that means I can go on to the, uh, the filter mask and, you know, mask in the blur where I want it. But the other thing you're saying is, well, but now where are all your adjustment layers? <laughs> you can't control them. I mean, it's awesome that you're not getting the ghosts of the mask, but where are the masks? Well, to get, they're not gone. They're contained inside the smart object. And if I want to go back and access any of those adjustments, I just double click on the smart object and give it a second to open up. But when that smart object opens up, what we find inside are all the layers and masks, and they're just fine. And I could come back in here and make adjustments to these and add new layers and do whatever I want. And then when I save it and go back to the smart object version of it, all those will be updated, and yet my blur will still match with it just fine. And so using it to avoid having to flatten layers using smart objects to avoid flattening layers and keeping your Photoshop uh, workflow non-destructive is reason number three. And those are my reasons for using smart objects in Photoshop. Wow, <laughs> we, we didn't want to interrupt you there, but that was that was so much good stuff all together. Wow. Um, I told you I'd be going warp speed to fit it in. <laughs> yes, and he did. That was great. We'll have to go back and rewatch that for sure. Um, let's answer a couple of questions too. Um, let's see here. Um, a couple people are asking, um, is this making the files a lot larger when you, uh, and how much larger when you make them smart objects? So, uh, the first part is yes, smart objects are bigger than non you know, images that have smart objects are bigger than images that don't have smart objects. And that's because they're storing more information and they're doing all kinds of calculations to keep all of that information available, to keep all this stuff non-destructive, to keep the information about how to, uh, what the filter, you know, the smart filters, all of that stuff. So that's the downside. 
Uh, the second part of the question is how much bigger? Uh, it really depends. I've run a lot of tests um, and it depends on how many smart objects you have, how much stuff is stored inside the smart objects. Uh, if you've got a ton of layers and a ton of uh, luminosity mass and things like that stored in a smart object, that makes it bigger. Um, but for me, uh, for, for me, storage and hard drive space is not my main priority. My main priority is having as much control over my adjustments and the ability to undo and work and keep my workflow non-destructive. Um, so for me, when I need a, a smart object, it's worth the, the file size hit. All right, very good. How about uh, that last thing that you showed there? Is that gonna replace grouping things together or are they similar? Good question here. It is a good question. So you can put, uh, you know, layers in Photoshop into groups, into a folder. And this comes down to, uh, I don't use smart objects when another method would work. So if all I need to do is group some layers into a folder, that does not add extra file size. It doesn't slow things down. So if the group folder is going to work and do the job, I would use that instead of a smart object. But in the case of like this filter that I did, uh, you can't filter a group. So if you want to filter, you've got to do the smart object uh, uh, method. Okay, and this is getting a little beyond me, but maybe this is related then. If you, if you put uh, <laughs> multiple filter effects together into a smart object, you only get one filter mask for all of the effects. Does that question make sense from Frank? It does, and that is correct. Yeah, you only get, just like on adjustment layers, you get one mask per layer. <laughs> and with uh, smart objects, you get one filter mask per, per smart object. So if you have three filters that are smart filters on that smart object, they're all gonna be filtered by that one mask. Um, and that is a little bit of a challenge, although I don't often add multiple filters to one smart object. Every once in a while I do. One workaround you can do, <laughs> if you really want to start going down the rabbit hole, is you can make a smart object and put a smart filter on that, and then make that smart object a smart object, and that new smart object will have a new filter mask, and you can do a second filter on that. And so it's kind of like a smart object, smart filter inception, you know, where how many layers deep does it go? I don't feel very smart anymore. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> even these objects are smarter than me. Oh my goodness. Uh, let's do just a couple more. Uh, David's asking you about uh, computer specs. Uh, I, I guess, I, I think you kind of hit upon it earlier that if you're gonna have a lot of different, uh, like luminosity masks or whatever in there, it's probably gonna take a, a, a newer, better computer. Is that right? Is that kind of the bottom line? Photoshop for sure is one of those things where if you're really going to be a heavy Photoshop user and have big Photoshop files that have lots of layers, lots of mass, lots of smart objects, it's not just smart objects, anything that grows your file size. If you're going to start doing stitched panoramas and that kind of stuff, gigapixel pan or gigapan type stuff, you're going to have big files and big files require computing uh, computer power and that's just the way it is. So yeah, um, the general rule with Photoshop is the bigger, uh, more powerful computer you have, the better. The faster it's gonna go, the smoother it's gonna be. So more RAM, bigger graphics card. Um, you know, if you can put your stuff on solid state drives, get a fast CPU. Uh, Puget Systems is a company, I'm not sponsored by them, but I do get my computers from them. They're out of Seattle, uh, Puget Systems. They do all kinds of testing and they actually have recommendations for Photoshop specific computer builds. And they'll, they, they even have one kind of ready to go that they say, this is for the money, the best Photoshop machine. Or you can talk to them and they'll even say, well, if you can't afford that, the best Photoshop machine, you know, what's the next best one? All right, perfect. Let's do one more. And from Barbara, how do you decide which images you use smart objects on? Are you using it most of the time in these situations, Sean? It kind of goes back to what I said before is because it is, you know, it does increase file size and it does kind of slow down the process. 
Um, I don't use them just automatically if I don't think I need them. Um, but if I want to be able to still get back to the original uh, raw data, I think, boy, my, my Lightroom adjustments, I think, are mostly where I want them, but I'm not 100% confident. Then opening a raw image as a smart object, I'll, that's what I'll do because that's what gives me access back to the original raw data and ability to undo the, the Lightroom settings that I set. Uh, and even with not the raw data element, you know, if, I, if I'm going to use a filter, I'm probably going to put it on a smart object so that it's a smart filter. So that, and that gives me that confidence that uh, if I didn't get the settings on the filter just right, I can always go in and tweak them later. Whereas if I don't use a smart object, I can't do that. All right. And I awesome. don't know, Go I know ahead. Sean wasn't able to see, but there was a lot of comments coming through about people who have taken your smart objects tutorial and how amazing it is. Um, so wanted to make sure we share that as well. And we do also have, Sean has been incredibly generous that we have one more giveaway and it is for all of the tutorials on his site. Um, if you don't know, Sean is, as someone put it, the king of Photoshop. Um, <laughs> That's right. <laughs> so they will win all of the tutorials on his site as well as the TK plugin um, for free. So, so this is huge. Can get, this is, yeah, this is over a, what, $350 value? Crazy. Thank you, Sean. Um, yes, thank you. And thank you to David as well. <laughs> um, <laughs> So this so, is a good time. If you've learned a lot from Sean and from David here, uh, yeah, give, give the video a thumbs up. We really, really appreciate it. So more people get out there and can uh, can it gets recommended to them. We really appreciate it. But uh, yeah, Chrissy, you're doing this giveaway. Go for it. All right. Everybody's ready. They're, I know they're like at their fingertips here. <laughs> what year was Photo Cascadia formed? And this is going into the comments, right? The first yes. person in the comments, the comments with the correct year the photo cascadia was founded and you can't google this one they said it early in the show we did say it yeah oh there you go is that Craig. right Craig. that is right Craig was listening <laughs> all right <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness i can't they're coming in so fast i can't even click on the right they're one changing in Victory <laughs> one that's awesome all right congratulations to craig uh, he can email you, right? Yes. Email me at chrissy at outofchicago.com to claim your amazing prize. I mean, both of those prizes are amazing. The Oregon, my Oregon book is, um, stunning. That's the only way to put it as well. So I think Chris, we have one more surprise. Oh my goodness. I don't know if this is a good idea, but we are going to do something and it might be silly, but yes. Are you ready? Well, maybe we need to ask Sean and David, if they're they ready. don't have a choice. Yeah, this is happening. <laughs> we have to figure out our pointing first. <laughs> so Chrissy has prepared a little uh, game for us to get to know uh, Sean and David a little bit better. Is that right, Chrissy? Yeah, I mean, you guys have spent so many years and so many days out in the backcountry together camping. You really get to know someone. So we figured we'd do kind of like a little rip on the newlywed game on, you know, how well do you know your companion or who claims this title? So the first one is, who is the better camp cook? <laughs> and what's, so what's, is there a right answer, Chrissy? How do we do this? There's no right answer. It's, I mean, I would assume sometimes it, they would agree and sometimes they're gonna disagree and they're gonna have to fight it out on who gets the title. <laughs> John so I think the answer coffee, to this one is makes dessert. I just pour water into a bag and go with it. So uh, John's I mean, a lot more elaborate than I, I am as a camp cook. I, I don't think so. Actually, when we're backpacking, we're both doing dehydrated backpacking food. So I was judging on who's actually the real better cook and in, in any part of life. And that would have to be David. Oh, OK. I'll go with that. <laughs> <laughs> All right, what's next? All right. Question number two, who is more likely to get lost? Mm. Ooh. Ooh. 
<laughs> yeah. Yes. Yeah. How do you point at yourself? Yeah. How did you do that? I can't point at myself. This this guy. I just didn't point because I knew he was right. So <laughs> that's pretty well, funny. It's just because you've been more, you've you know walked more miles, so you had more chances to get lost. That's right. They did Probably send us that. some videos, and so I think we could. That was great. So that's so, a couple clips. What else you got, Chrissy? So who stops more often to take photographs? Mm. Uh, that <laughs> You'd have to say the ooh, flower man. <laughs> I usually have my camera back in my packed away in my backpack and Sean's got it on his hip, so he's shooting all the time. Mm. We might see that yeah. in a minute here. Yeah. Yeah. So Next question then, who is better at packing or more meticulous about packing their gear in their pack? <laughs> <laughs> so these are the ones we want to show. That shows. <laughs> yeah, that's right. All right. Uh, that's I love that's it. that's the kind of hubris you can have after you've backpacked hundreds of thousands of miles. Oh, wow. Exactly. That's right. All right. What else, Chrissy? All right, we have two more. Who is better prepared for changing weather conditions? Mm. I, I think we're both good at that. I. Sean's been in super, yeah, Sean's been in super extreme weather, especially he, were camp, he was camped out in Denali for 20 days. So, uh, I can't beat that. Wow. I think, but I, I think you pay closer attention to the weather. I think when the bad weather hits, I can survive, but you actually know when the weather's going to hit and what it's going to do. Well, there's that. <laughs> That's <laughs> there's why you're that. good together then. <laughs> exactly. Probably. All right, let's do one more. All right. Last one for the evening. Up. Who is likely to be packed and ready to leave camp first in the morning? Wait, say it Me. again. Who Me. is likely to be I... packed and ready to leave camp first in the morning? <laughs> <laughs> David. <laughs> yeah. When you're not meticulous, you get it. You get it in really fast. He's ready to go. <laughs> <laughs> and Sean's off taking photographs of the flowers. So <laughs> I love it. I'm standing there. around talking a lot. <laughs> I love it. That was great. All right. So, uh, oh, I meant to, uh, I was supposed to show this earlier, right, Chrissy? Yeah. That was our hiking partner challenge. And uh, we're all winners. <laughs> Very good. Is this David? Who is this? Yeah, that's, that's me. David. That yeah. Is David. Are you lost? <laughs> uh, no. no we were just off trail we were, we were going for a photo in the north cascades national park and uh yeah the clouds are in the valley again i think every time we go out there's clouds in the valley so that is so cool so cool yeah, yeah that's not there's no pull off to get this shot is there there's no yeah no, no. yeah that is awesome all right. It's been great to uh, get to hear about some of these adventures. Great to get to know Oregon a little bit better. Uh, we really appreciate all the tips about photographing the small scenes in Oregon. And uh, of course, the smart objects. You guys have been great. Uh, Chrissy, what else can we add here before we shut this whole show down? Nothing. I 
I think everybody is very excited to kind of either go out tomorrow or tonight, whatever time it is where you are, and look down. I mean, I think we're all going to be looking for um, small scenes. And then when we get home, I think we're all going to be doing some path blurs maybe, but opening and taking a closer look at smart objects. So, I mean, just thank you guys for giving us a taste of inspiration. Yeah, yeah. If you guys want to throw a thank comment you. in thanking these guys, we really appreciate it. Can't wait to see both of you in Oregon. Uh, and those of you that are watching, can't wait to see you in a few weeks if you're joining us in Death Valley or maybe in the Smoky Mountains in April or even online in March for Out of Chicago Live. So uh, really excited. Thank you, Chrissy. Thank you, Sean. Thank you, David. This is the end. Yeah, We're man. signing off. See you in about two days, Sean. <laughs> you guys have fun. Yeah, thanks, everybody. It's been fun. Yeah, All right. See you guys. Bye-bye. Take care.